The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Remember the days, eh? When all Trump could stuff up was hiring the wrong person. Money, money, money. Today it was helicopter uh, politics again. Any form of apprenticeship will be free from July until December 2022. That is the news today from our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and Education Minister Chris Hipkins. It has been confirmed as the Targeted Training and Apprenticeship Fund, TTAF, and it will pay for Kiwis of all ages to undertake vocational education and training for two and a half years. And the coin will land in training our much-needed people in the agriculture, horticulture and forestry sectors. Any form of apprenticeship. Joel, do you want an apprenticeship? Any form. We could start an apprenticeship scheme here. There's free money. <laughs> yeah, I could do it with someone. Just like they could come in here, push all the buttons for me. That will be good. <laughs> Rub your feet, make you a cup of tea. Absolutely. Oh, that will be lovely. <laughs> and, uh, and and teach them a thing or two about uh, media in the new world. Now, imagine sheep and beef farmers getting paid to take on a new person as an apprenticeship rather than just straight out employment. Has the industry been doing it wrong all along? I know Minister Damien O'Connor has been critical that food and fibre producers need to learn a thing or two about attracting and retaining in the form of apprenticeships, similar to an electrician or builder. What's your thoughts? Add them in the comments of the live stream below. Now, welcome to Sarah's Country. I'm your host, Sarah Perriam, and this little show, Sarah's Country, has certainly grown its legs from its humble beginnings launched in lockdown, and it's now attracting some serious attention as a future of broadcasting, we think, here in rural media, being all things to all people everywhere all the time. So, of course, if you're listening to this on demand on podcast or live on your phone or your big smart TV via Facebook or YouTube, we're now in 15 different places all at once. Our live audience, good evening tonight. We want to hear from you about your first job or your worst job. What was it? Where was it? And what did it teach you? Would you ever do it again? Throughout the show, I'm going to share a few of my earlier jobs, uh, just like the CEO, uh, Sinead Boucher who's just bought stuff for a dollar, New Zealand's largest uh, news online network. She started her career out flipping burgers. Joel, I'd love to know. I know you worked in a dirty, seedy nightclub as a photographer, but what was your very, very first job? Um, my first job was a bit of a different one. Uh, I was an assistant gymnastics coach for a few years uh, whenever I was 16, teaching all the, the younger the kids how to do it. Okay, so to teach them, you obviously know a thing or two about gymnastics? Yeah, I could probably pull out a half-decent cartwheel, yeah. <laughs> what was your fave? What? My fave? Favourite Oh, Gymnast thing um, that you do. Ribbon. Ribbon. <laughs> yeah, twirling around the dance floor on, on a ribbon. Uh, no, I, I, lo- I enjoyed the vault and uh, I was half decent on the P bars. They were all right. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was all good fun. You never scared as a man that you're going to land in the wrong spot? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do. But like, you, you, you hobble off and you get over it and yeah. it's all right. <laughs> Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, yeah. My first job was uh, actually my official first non-working for my appearance job that was, was picking and packing cherries in Central Otago. And I, honestly, I can't eat cherries anymore. It makes me feel sick. I obviously ate a few too many when I was picking them. So we want to know, and let's discuss this, you know, what was the best thing about uh, your, you know, that your first job? What is the best thing about where you work now? Uh, is it about working outside, the lifestyle? Um, is, it, is it your boss? I mean, I like my boss. She's pretty good to me. Uh, she lets me have time off whenever I like. Now, one job that's been doing very well at the moment is the beef job. A combination of the reduction in tariffs into Japan for New Zealand has been benefiting our red meat exports as well as strong and enduring relationships across our our diverse markets around the world. This has allowed us to weather the COVID-19 storm. We're going to learn more about that from CEO of the Meat Industry Association, Surma Karapiva, after 7.20.
Now, Queen's Birthday Weekend was incredible. Rain across the North Island, business booming for the first time in months with those tills ringing money, 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 and of course, for our most deserving receiving uh, rece- reception recipients of the highest honour of the Queen's Birthday Honour. Uh, after 7.30, we're going to head to the Wairapa to catch up with Bruce McKenzie from the uh, Mangahina Stud. He's been awarded a Companion Order of Merit for his services to the cattle industry. And find out how COVID-19 was not going to stop this family uh, holding their celebration of 75 years from that very first on-farm bull sale. 30 years ago when scanning technology was developed for commercial use in sheep pregnancy detection, it was deservedly hailed as a leap forward in helping better measure our ewe productivity. In 2020 we're leaping further forward to technology that will see collars on ewes to accurately identify lambs raised by each ewe and determine the strength of that special mother lamb bond. We're going to be joined by Amy Charteris, formerly of the Omega Lamb Project uh, and now director with Mike Tate of the Four Good Foods with this new technology. But first up, we're going to continue this chat around jobs and apprenticeships and how it all, uh, the targeted training and apprenticeship fund that was announced today for vocational education and training. The dairy industry we know is desperate to employ staff as carving approaches and many skills are just going to be have to be learnt on the job. Farm for Life's Tangaroa Walker is going to join us about the launch of his Farm for Life hub. While we get Tangaroa on the line, let's have a look at the episode that features him uh, in the wonderful Global HQ On Farm Story series. This is Sarah's Country. I found a lot of farmers were so flat out, we just want to get the job done, and you never get an understanding for why you're actually doing that job. A lot of farmers at the moment are complaining about staff not having initiative. It's probably because the people that they worked for previously didn't teach them the why. They just taught them the how. I was 21, 22 years old when I went contract milking. I didn't know what I was doing. To be honest, you know, I was just winging it. The best person to learn off in terms of how to do things is somebody that's actually doing it. Really want to try and encapsulate that with Farm for Life so that people that are trying to be successful at 22, 23 years old will have that information available for them. I'm Tangaroa Walker and I'm a dairy farmer in South Meta Kanui Dairy Limited Partnership. We're running a 570 cow dairy farm and we're milking off 180 hectares. I'm contract milking on this farm and I employ two staff and a calf rear. I'm originally from Tauranga. The little lifestyle block that I was brought up on, we used to have our school cross country on the farm and this guy turned up and he had this awesome car. Here it is. This guy hops out of his car and his missus hopped out and she was beautiful and I was like, Fire out, who's this guy? And he walked up in his overalls and I was like, G'day man, what do you do for a job? And he was like, oh, I'm a farmer. Yeah. Sort of inspired me a little bit. 10 kilos at seven tonne. I ended up going to work for that guy when I was 13. I was gardening and then the next minute I was milking and next minute he was going away on holiday and I was trying to run the farm for him while he was away and right all of a sudden here I am. Gee guys, what up? Welcome back to Farm for Life. We're gonna have a bit of a race. We're just setting up our spring paddock. Three, two, one, one go. go. So Farm for Life is like an educational social media site. It sort of just started on accident really. I was just filming myself on the farm and people were asking heaps of questions and thought it was quite cool. And then I got a few private messages around people just saying that it's really helped in their farming journey or people that were at school were saying, oh, I really want to go farming now. It sort of gave me a bit of drive to feed that sort of information through to those people. Yeah, and the milk will actually build up, it won't check all, all your other stock as well. Now it's a responsibility that I sort of try and paint the full picture of dairy farming, walking the walk while I'm talking the talk. She's bloody hard work, eh? With the farm lifestyle and that, you get caught up in the farm and you know, all its stresses and whatnot. And then I met my partner and she introduced me to this thing called CrossFit. And I was like, holy shit, I bloody like the buzz that we get here. 
So we decided to open up a functional fitness gym in town in Invercargill called The Barracks. So that's a really good outlet for me, being able to get people fit, healthy, and create a really cool workout environment at our gym is awesome. What makes dairy farming a bloody awesome career to be in is there's just so much different shit to do on farm. One day I'll be like in town with my bank manager and my accountant blaring on about budgets and then the next day I'll be like knees deep in a bloody pond or I might be addressing my staff about the situation that's happened on farm or I'll be teaching them or I'll be videoing stuff. Who's that stranger? Can you fix that trough wire there? There's so many different aspects of farming and I can comfortably support my family. You know, we've got a good secure house, we've, we've got meat, we've got milk. You know, just a really solid platform to raise a family on and I can't wait to bring up my son on, on my farm, so it'll be wicked. All right, now I want your comments through. We are moderating the chat underneath this live stream. We're talking about your first job that you ever had, not the one for if you grew up on a farm from your parents, the one outside of that, or your worst job that you've ever done. I want to hear from you. Uh, just, I know there's a lot of people watching. I can see the numbers are huge tonight. I want to hear from you in the comments below. Now, George, what do you mean by what's the go with Dairy and Z? Please explain yourself and uh, we can help with that. Now, by the end of September, around 2,500 visas are due to expire for migrant staff currently working on dairy farms. Many of those are based in Canterbury, Waikato, Southland and Otago. Both farmers and farm staff are desperately seeking some certainty and Dairy NZ and Federated Farmers are seeking uh, extensions from the government on existing visas to ensure migrant staff can continue working here in the short and medium term. But Kiwis need to get on board and up to speed quick. Uh, we only have a couple of months and we just and we may just have the answer. Joining us now is a legend himself, Tangaro Walker from Farm for Life to discuss his up-and-coming launch of Farm for Life Hub. Now, firstly, Tangaroa, uh, we, I know a, a fair bit about you now. There is a story that you shared when we were sp uh, doing a bit of a speaking tour that I really loved. I'd love to kick off with it. Uh, how you hassled your first boss for a job and that curly, let's just call it, interview process when you got the job. Do you know the story I'm meaning? Yeah, it depends which one, which one we're talking about. Are we talking about the, the my first ever job on a dairy farm? Uh, the guy that came to the door in a certain yeah. suit. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want some advice for the young fellas who want to get a job at a dairy farm. What are they going to do? <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose um, you've you got to be keen, but um, the first thing, I'm, I'm not going to mention that story because I don't want to I don't want to uh, <laughs> embarrass the poor man. But pretty much I walked up a, a long driveway, jumped off the school bus and... Um, and rocked on up there and asked him if I could have a job on his farm. And um, I think it would have been about maybe 13, 12 or 13, might, might have been 12 or 13. And then, yeah, it all kicked off from there. Started off uh, doing gardening and all of a sudden I was down at the cow shed um, hosing out and that turned to getting into the, getting the cows. And the next minute he was, um, he was away on, 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 on having the weekend off and I was milking and, and that's where it all sort of snowballed into this awesome thing. Do you, th do you think that's what it is? It's just uh, pure persistency and keenness that, that elevates you through an industry like the dairy industry? Look, I think um, just, just with everything, if you've got the, if you're eager to learn and uh, you show a little bit of attitude, whether you're playing sports um, at school or, um, you know, trying to, trying to apply for a job, people sort of just gravitate to that sort of, um, that sort of behaviour and you want to help people through, right? Um, so you always know someone who's keen and, Keen to learn or eager, and then has a bit of attitude there. I mean, you always either want to hate, love, love, love them, or hate them. And you see it on the rugby field all the time. And, um, and I think that was just the, the the way that it rolled out on, on the dairy, dairy industry. And you see those people coming through, and they make it all the way to the top, and and are very successful. We would have been uh, absolutely lost after over the last five to ten years without our migrant workers. Uh, and yeah. what, what is that stumbling block? Why are we not attracting Kiwis into these roles? Oh, look, mate, I think uh, there's two things going on. It's 
there's a lot of other options for for us Kiwis to go and, and, and enjoy work and and get the uh, you know the the two days off a, a week um, you know sort of roster and to, to, to try and get a Kiwi to work work through his weekend pretty tough. Eh? Um, I know I remember I still remember when I used to have to work on the weekends as a relief milker. Um, I, I used to sort of you know think, Jesus, luckily I'm getting paid really well as a as a 13, 14 year old. Um, but sort of that, that sort of money still still around today, um, and, and, and those people have got plenty of other options. It's quite hard trying to be working on the weekend and all your friends are out getting on the piss as a young fella, you know, and you've got to get up and milk your cows in the mornings. Um, so that's probably a big stumbling block. And with you know migrant workers coming in, they they're keen to work whenever you know it's, um, they're bringing their supporting their families back home and sort of different mindset. Yeah, now we're going to come to a real crunch point with those visas at, uh, at risk and not being able to attract more. Um, before we get into the next phase of uh, Farm for Life, what would your suggestion yep. be to the dairy industry to recruit and retain staff? Um, I think we just need to we need to change change things up big time. And, you know, gone are the days of trying to get our staff to mould into the way that we operate our farm systems. Um, I think we, you know, cows are pretty, pretty diverse animals. They seem to change with the weather overnight, and you know they'll they'll slowly start changing to the way that we milk and the routine that we milk in. And I think, uh, like personally, on, on on my farm here, I've definitely had the most successful year I've ever had in the dairy industry with recruiting not only ret- retention of my staff but also just staff morale, um, their uh, their attitude at work, um, and also the the way that they're doing the job, they really want to get an understanding of the job. And look, these are just average Kiwis. Um, you know, I've got a, you know, just got a, got Detroit here working for me, and and Goody, who's um, who's from India, and they just the morale is just unreal when we do a five and two roster. It's you know, it's crazy. Although it might cost a little bit more on the pocket, um, you definitely sleep more at night. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, talking, let's get into this. Farm for Life has exploded as a social media success, but there is that's yep. certainly just like uh, 1.0 of what is in store for Tangaroa Walker and Farm for Life. I'm very excited uh, about this up and coming launch. Let's get into it. Tell us all about it, the Farm for Life hub. All right, so, so when I, I won the Yahoo Fenua in 2012, and I remember getting up on the stage and saying, you know, speaking after I'd won that competition and saying, look, we, you know, we need a better way of teaching our staff. We need, we need to get into to this realm of technology and we need to make information available for people because there's so much, so many experts in all different, you know, corners of the dairy industry. Uh, but unfortunately, it's quite hard to get all that knowledge from all of those experts. And look, whether you're milking a cow today or milking a cow 30 years ago, or milking a cow in 2050, the cow still needs to be milked the same. It's not going to change. So um, why don't we sort of create some sort of learning hub um, to to, to capture all that information and make it accessible for people um, coming through the industry? So, look, I've been sort of had this idea in the back of my mind since 2012, so for the last eight years, and I've always come to this big stumbling block of how are we going to sell it, you know, who... How would we get it out there? How would we expose it to all of these farmers that live in the middle of, uh, you know, out on the, the East Coast or these, par- these farmers that are way out of the back of Gore and up in central Otago and that sort of thing? Like, how, how do we expose it to those sorts of people that don't, you know, that aren't out there all the time going to town and, and mixing and mingling with the public? Um, so three years ago, I, I thought to myself, and had, had a bit of a yarn with a couple of my networks and and the advice given and, and was uh, to try and create a social media platform because I think in, you, in, in the world there's only one other guy um, who's doing it who's in America, and he's got a huge following. He's probably about three times uh, bigger than mine. But for me, it was never about trying to be famous or trying to you know try and be this guy. Um, it was all about trying to build this platform um, of education and knowledge and try and share all of these different things about the dairy industry because we are more than just farmers. You talk to farmers every day and they say, oh, you know, you say, oh, what do you do for a job? Oh, I'm just a farmer. Um, just the farmer is so much more and there's so much more than just being a farmer. Um, and, and the farmers know, like, I'm just, you know, I'm talking to the converter there. But um, there is, if I could capture everything that we did on a farm, so we, you know, ranging from 
our, our business meetings that we have with our shareholders um, to our meetings that we have at the bank and applying for all our loans and you know, covering off IRD, tax, PAY, um, our staff meetings, right down to carving cows, how to change a motorbike tyre and tighten the chain on a motorbike or you know, talking about health and safety, sign and all that sort of stuff and just trying to keep up with the rules and regulations of, around environmental um, you know, situations going on in the, in the media um, and, and making all of that information available. So, you know, this was the whole aim of the social media platform was to build this, this, this mess of people, this mess of following, so that then we can start working on the hub um, and start developing this, this app-style uh, product that we can sort of, or resource, should I say, um, that's going to be available for everybody in the world try and access that information. I always like it when you can give me an example. Okay, scenario. You've got a young fella there, uh, he's a bit green around the ears on a certain type of skill on farm. How will this hub yep. help both uh, employer and employee? So um, the, our, our motto underneath the Farm for Life hub is um, experience before you need it. So Firstly, they would never get into that situation. So in two months' time, we, we're bringing out our app before carving down here in Southland. We're bringing our app out, and what the app is going to show, unfortunately, I'm not on camera for those that are listening at the moment. Um, I've been sort of trying to over-explain my hands are just moving around everywhere. <laughs> um, but on the farm owner's app or the, the employer's app, you'll jump on there, and um, he will have, there'll be three different categories within that app. Um, so we've got, say, the... So if we've got carving, for example, and then you'll click on carving it in the second box down, it'll drop down into another box, which will be like all the things that happen in carving. So like, you know, ketosis or, you know, uh, metabolic problems or carving problems. And then as soon as you click on, say, carving problems, it'll then drop down into the third box, all the different carving problems that would happen, uh, most likely happen on the on the dairy farm. So C-sections, you know, uh, breach, carving those sorts of things, and you click on that video, and that video will be a video with myself and a, and a key vet um, delivering that, that calf and the process and all the tools and equipment that are going to be needed for that situation. So the aim of it is that the boss can drag and drop that information, whether it be the whole module, um, so the carving module or the section that's underneath the, the module if he wants to go a little bit finer, or if he actually just wants to go really fine and he's got a manager that's never done a C-section before, he just click on the C-section one, drag drag it down above, say, Goody's name. So if I've got Goody and Detroit, my stuff that I've got on my farm, and he'll just release it off the phone and it'll drop down into uh, Goody's inbox. And then Goody will get a notification in his uh, Farm for Life Hub app. Um, and that'll pop up as a video that Goody needs to watch. And the boss will be able to, well, I'll be able to watch and see how much of that video he's watched and when he watched it. And then Goody's going to have a really good understanding of how to carve a, carve a cow uh, in terms of the C-section uh, before that happens. So that's going to be coming out in August. And so at the moment, we've got about 170 videos that should be loaded by the 15th of June up into the hub. So there'll be also a search engine. So if the staff are out, say, um, say Detroit goes down and tries to fix, you know, gets the cows in and there's a there's a paddock there with a the trough leaking. He can just type in there, trough broken, or if there's a, you know, a trough arm that's broken, he'll just type in trough arm and it'll come up with heaps of different videos around how to fix that trough um, then and there. So it might be 4 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock at night or whenever. It doesn't have to ring the boss and say, oh, oh there's a broken trough and the boss has to stop his dinner and go down there and fix that trough, you know. That's so great. That's so great. I mean, there's a lot, I can just hear a lot of people sighing of relief of not, like, as you said, having to ring the boss uh, and potentially get your ass kicked. So uh, well done, <laughs> Tangaroa. Fabulous work and uh, pulling that all together. Tangaroa Walker from Farm for Life talking about the Farm for Life hub that is about to be launched, kicking off with a couple of hundred videos, but uh, I know this man has uh, thousands in him of educational videos that you will be able to subscribe to and share within your stuff so they can go back and be able to uh, get amongst and learn all those little intricate things. There's so much to learn. Honestly, we don't take on board how much there is in our industry for somebody who's so new and green to it and to support them through it. Now, of course, you'll see along the bottom, that is the Daily Digest brought to you by Farmers Weekly. Uh, if you want to get a bit of a Daily Digest in your inbox every day, rather than waiting for that paper on Monday, head to farmersweekly.co.nz forward slash e-newsletter and sign up. 
Now, coming up next on Serious Country, processing and exporting companies are out there exploring for the silver lining to the COVID disruptions to provide our industry more opportunities to look at different channels to market, despite the business as usual that has been for our export of our red meat. All that with Meat Industry Association CEO Surma Karapiva next here on Serious Country. This is Sarah's Country. Balance has its own team of innovation specialists. It's our job to lead the way, working with some of the most cutting edge science and research. We've got partnerships with some of the best suppliers in the world, so our farmers get the very best products for New Zealand farms. And in every region across the country, the conditions are very different, and farmers and growers' needs are too. That's why we're always looking for solutions that are just right, like here at our Huntley Service Centre. And here in Canterbury, we've got a self-service silo, so I can pick up fit when it suits me. And here in Morrinsville, we've got a world-class mill. That means that we can safely deliver our customers with the freshest, highest quality feed and minerals. It's about putting the customer first because that's what drives our business. We've been focusing on faster turnaround of orders. We've got to get the right products to the right places at the right times. Here in Taranaki, we've got New Zealand's only urea manufacturing plant. It's where we create our premium sustained fertiliser. We're supplying nationwide and working locally. By getting to know you and what you want to achieve, we can help you get there. And with the new My Balance platform, Balance has put my farm at my fingertips. In fact, we offer support in all sorts of ways, sharing the best nutrition practice with farming families across the country. Whether we're talking about animal health, farm productivity, or looking after our natural environment, sustainability underpins everything we do. We use our local expertise and the latest tools to help farmers and growers navigate the changing regulations, so you can leave your farm in great shape for the future. And we can be really accurate avoiding areas like wetlands and waterways with our award-winning Spread Smart Tech. It makes the job far safer, more efficient, and gives you the best results. When you've got access to that kind of know-how, you've got the support you need to make sure you're farming sustainably. It's that kind of thinking that'll keep us going for generations to come. Together creating the best soil and feed on earth. Delicious. Ever wondered where it starts? Does it start with care? Respect. Fresh grass, 365 days a year. The truth is, delicious doesn't start in a single moment or with a single ingredient. Delicious starts here. Loving your comments coming in below. Uh, now, Jock Innes wants to share his first job was a shepherd at Mount Albert Station in Wanaka for two years. Amazing experience uh, on a horse every day. Very isolated, but an adventure. Uh, great hunting, and the weather had a big impact on the day-to-day -day work. A fabulous part of the world, Mount Albert Station, Jock. Uh, very, very special. And Michelle Wallace wants to say, well done, Tangaro. I love your work, mate. Uh, we are talking about your very first job you've ever had or your worst job. Uh, uh, I will share with you what my worst job was uh, later in the show, and I'm sure Joel will share his too. Now, the monthly value of New Zealand's red meat and co-product exports for April was largely unchanged from the same month last year, despite the massive disruption of COVID-19. We exported $859 million of lamb, mutton, beef and co-products. Some markets were down others were up. There's been a softening of prices, but demand is now increasing for prime cuts due to our advantage, of course, of our natural grass-fed attributes of New Zealand red meat. Joining us now for the analysis of this is CEO for Meat Industry Association, Surma Karapiva. Good evening, ma'am. How are you? Good evening. No, I'm very good, thank you. And how are you? Good, good. You're looking very beautiful and sharp there. Um, I do like a good internet connection. <laughs> Especially well, in this world. Up for the time being. Yeah. 
Mm. Now let's go around the world, Surma. Uh, what was hot and what was not in terms of our markets over the last month for red meat? Oh, well, I mean, I think your intro comments summed it up really well. It's been, you know, the continuation of, of the volatility just continues and some markets are up, some are down. Um, on the upside, we're saying China's continuing to recover. So we're up to 16%, um, up to about $353 million, which is um, quite positive. But, um, you know, we're also seeing a number of other markets take a dip. We've seen our total exports to, to the United Kingdom take a dip by 27% and um, also some uh, exports to Germany taken a, a dip by 30%. So it's up and down. Um, the US is also slightly down, but that's a whole a whole other story um, and that is in its own right. Um, on the positive side, I guess, is that we're seeing a lot of diversification into different markets. So Japan and Taiwan, for example, were the, the shining stars in this uh, particular month. And uh, we saw 66% increase of our total exports to Japan and a significant number of about 36% to Taiwan. So, you know, the market diversification strategy is continuing to play uh, its role in, in uh, ensuring that our exports can continue and ensuring that those very, very valuable export dollars continue to flow back into New Zealand. We topped a record in March 2020, Surma, with uh, over a billion dollars of our uh, red meat exports. Is that setting, we did is that setting the precedent of, of, of the future, regardless of uh, an economic downturn of such grave significance globally? Well, it's really hard to say. Um, I think March was, um, I mean, it was a great outcome. A, a billion dollars is probably the first time that we've had that monthly you know, trade figure. Um, so kudos to all the people that were involved in, in getting there. But I think it was also the combination of a number of um, delayed orders that were placed early in the year. And because of the disruption in uh, logistics and exports, they got counted into the um uh, the March trade figures. So, you know, it'd be great to say the future is all up and we're going to um, reap the benefits of our excellent um, providence and the, the great product that we've got to offer. But I suspect, as you mentioned, the economic downturn across the globe is going to come and play um, into this. And we've seen some uh, sectors shutting down, the food service, for example, where our premium cuts um, goes into uh, is really struggling in the United States and in Europe. Um, and we're seeing that impact on the volume and value of chilled products being sold overseas that has fallen back a bit. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's some time to go before we start seeing those billion dollar monthly returns um, again. But anyway, 800 and uh, nearly 60 million is not a bad return. No, it's not. <laughs> and um, I mean, how much of it is actually to do with some seriously good trade negotiation? I mean, 87% up on this time last year, purely due to those tariff uh, reductions into Japan for our beef exports. Uh, I mean, the, yeah. the, the the rise of global protectionism and the disregard of the strength of the, the you know, all the rules of the WTO are worrying oh, yeah, I mean, in our role. future negotiations. Yeah. Mm. Well, they, I mean, the, the, um, in Japan, in the case of Japan, for example, um, we, we faced really high tariffs, 38.5% tariffs before the FTA came into play. And since then, we've seen a reduction in tariffs, incre incremental reduction of tar tariffs, but nonetheless, um, a reduction. The last round of tariff reductions was um, happened on the 1st of April. And so now we are 26.5% for our beef exports. Now you'll recall from uh, sometime last year when we spoke about the fact that Japan is our most valuable chilled, chilled beef um, market, and that continues to be the case. It really is an important market. Um, and it's great that we're seeing that tariff come down um, we're seeing those uh, tariff costs come down and we're reaping the benefit 
of the CPTPP in that market. Before you go, Surma, we're talking a lot about uh, apprenticeships and in particular the processing industry and attracting and retaining staff. What are you hoping to see for this huge amount of $1.6 billion from the government into trading, uh, training sorry, our Kiwis? Mm. Well, well, Sarah, you see, um, we are one of the largest manufacturers uh, in New Zealand, manufacturing employers in New Zealand. And as a result of that, we're also one of the largest on-the-job trainers. We trained last year, I think we trained something like 5,300 people to NZQA um, recognised qualifications. What I'm hoping to see is more support for that on-the-job training, particularly as we're looking to onboard um a number of New Zealanders that are that have recently lost their jobs and are looking for new opportunities in new sectors. We have a sustained labour labour shortage in our sector. Um, this is not news to to anyone that has been following um, the ups and downs of, of our sector, but it is sustained. And now is an opportunity for us to provide a provide a pathway for Kiwis looking for jobs to come into an industry that offers not only Fair, fair wages and competitive wages, but also um, on-the-job training, upskilling and career pathways and opportunities. Um, so hopefully some of that um, budget money that was announced will, will come our way and will help um, our uh, companies uh, step up their tra- on-the-job training. They'll provide for some um, support for people looking to relocate to those regional centres where our companies operate. Um, and will help them to to onboard with uh, with new jobs into the processing sector. Thank you so much, CEO for Meat Industry Association, the Asuma Cara Piva. Remember the days when you used to go and uh, work hard uh, either on the boning room or shearing and you'd buy your own farm. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we went back to those those days? Now, coming up on Sarah's Country, going back to the old days, established in 1907, hosting an on-farm bull sale every year for 75 years, six generations of family. We're going to be joined by the wonderful Bruce McKenzie from Mangahini, Hereford, Charolais and Speckle Park stud in the Wairapa following Bruce's wonderful Queen's birthday honour of a Companion Order of Merit yesterday. This is Sarah's Country. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horse feed. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Because we're out here too. Week's Queen's birthday This is Sarah. Celebrated a very special man in the rural sector, uh, cattle stud breeder Bruce McKenzie from the Mangahina stud in the Wairapa, with a companion order of, order of merit, a very, very special uh, acknowledgement of his services to the cattle industry. And he joins me now. Good evening, sir. We can't say sir exactly, it wasn't that title, but <laughs> close. <laughs> Maybe it. Maybe another 20 years. <laughs> oh, and hey, what a special year, though, Bruce, for you to receive such an honour. 75 years, uh, is it, uh, of breeding or of the sale? Uh, one of the old, the oldest Hereford stud in New Zealand, I believe. Um, it's um, founded in 1907, so we're 113 years old. And uh, the very special this year to be our 75th sale coming up. And I've been to 74 of them, even though I wasn't a bassinet for probably a couple of them. And one of them I missed because I was in England. So 74 is a pretty good shot. 
It is. So for our viewers who aren't familiar with the Munger Keener stud, would you be able to explain it's not just Herefords? Uh, no, we've, we've been uh, in the Herefords for that number of years, but uh, we had Charolais. Uh, red, I started the Red Charolais, breeding from the, the Red Factor gene, and uh, I've bred those for 25 years. And that more recently, uh, we've brought in the Speckle Park breed from Canada, which have been very successful. Five generations, Bruce. You must be extremely proud of both your father and, of course, the next generation at Mangahina. I'm extremely proud of the fact that they are interested in carrying on what's going, uh, what we've set up. And uh, we have the sixth generation, Molly, who's absolutely looking forward to the next move as well. So all I want to do is be able to leave a good standard of stock for her to carry on with. Now, in all of your years, Bruce, you would have seen both a lot of changes to both farming, but also, of course, breeding cattle. What are some of those noticeable changes? Well, in the early days, the cattle were too small in my eyes, and we needed to improve the frame and structure of them. And uh, so by bringing in uh, imported cattle, which I did. I imported 12 bulls, live bulls, into New Zealand in my time, uh, six from England originally, and then to improve the frame, uh, because let's suppose we're paid by weight, so we wanted to increase the frame and length of the cattle, so I brought in five or six bulls from Canada, and that was very successful, and um, we bred back to our own bloodlines, and we're going exceptionally well with them at the moment. Actually, that's a, a, a point I'd like to ask you about the difference between those uh, British genetics and, of course, the Canadian genetics, Bruce. Uh, they're predominantly uh, in a lot of feedlots and finishing. How do you balance those genetics with our New Zealand conditions? Well, Herefords uh, a pretty resilient breed and... Uh, They've proved back in hot, cold countries and hot countries that they can handle the conditions. And uh, we've found that we've had no problem with that. Uh, by bringing these cattle in, they can handle heat and cold. I'm very interested in uh, one day being the proud owner of a speckled park rug. <laughs> because they're so beautiful. Uh, but there's more to a speckled park than just how lovely it looks on the floor. Yes, they're, they're a special breed um, I first saw them in Canada when I was buying the Herefords and followed them for four or five years over there. And uh, when you see a breed that can win four and five consecutive years of fat stock competitions in Calgary, one had to have a look at them. And so uh, that's when I said to my son, you go over to Canada and find the very best genetics you can find in this breed. And that's exactly what he did. And the first year we put in 150 embryos and we've carried on from there. We went in with Waironga, my station, a big place here in the Wairapa, the Matthews family, so that we could have a big number of embryos put in so that we could have a, a strong culling rate. And with a new breed, you need to be able to cull heavily. Otherwise, you can't get anywhere. And so we did that. And then after three or f uh, four years, uh, we split up and took our own stock, and that's gone from there. And at the moment, we have uh, seven bulls in the AI station, which we're supplying up to 40,000 straws of semen for the dairy industry, for the LIC. And uh, they're going exceptionally well in that dairy section because Kiwi cows carry a marbling gene. And when you put the speckle park over the, the Kiwi cows, you increase this chance of marbling and good meat. And so they're going exceptionally well in the dairy industry. Fantastic. Bit of hybrid vigour there, Bruce. Now, now Bruce, Absolutely. something you probably haven't seen in all your years is something like COVID-19. It's, uh, it's had a dramatic effect on the bull sale season and some changes to what's normally uh, the date for you, you've, but you've still stuck to it because, of course, it's at 75 years since your first on-farm sale. Yes, well, we shifted it for that reason and the droughts in the Hawke's Bay and, and North Auckland, we decided that uh, the best thing we could try and hope for, uh, that we could have a crowd at our sale and have a normal sale. So we shifted the date back to the 2nd of July. 
uh, and hoping that uh, that will be successful. First established in 1907, Mangahina starred in the Wairarapa and we're speaking to uh, Bruce McKenzie because of course that companion of Order of Merit uh, granted to, I want to say Sir Bruce, <laughs> not just you there, uh, <laughs> it is what a wonderful uh, accolade to all of your services to the cattle industry, Bruce. On behalf of everybody watching and listening to Serious Country, can I just say congratulations tonight and uh, I hope you have a nice bubbly. Thank you very much. We're going to have a party on Saturday and kick our heels up. Wonderful. That's Bruce. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Bruce McKenzie there out of uh, Wairapa from the very uh, well-known Mangahina stud. We're both Hereford, of course, that they're renowned for, but Charolais and Speckled Park. Now, to close the show, one of my very dear friends, uh, one of those women that, you know, when they wink, you know that they're going to take on a challenge. Her name is Amy Charteris. On to her new project. Uh, this is very interesting, putting collars around ewes to Bluetooth to their lambs. All that coming up on Serious Country. This is Sarah's Country. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. Do you reckon it'll come out? Cover it until I'm to leave it 10 minutes. You'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'll go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. great was Bruce. Now Eric uh, Mark Lou says uh, can we say hello to Bruce uh, from Y O um, wrong am I well, uh, yes station sorry Pre excuse my today oh Eric I'm learning all the time uh, bloody nice guy and congratulations and uh, Eric says he also has a car floor rug I'm assuming that's of a speckle park Eric aren't they just stunning their coats uh, now, if Simon and George, I've actually texted somebody from Dairy NZ to find out where that vote is. And if I do find out before the end of the show, I will let you know when we can expect an outcome of that levy vote that was Saturday, of course. Tonight, we are sharing our first job or our worst job. Come on, in the comments below, I want to hear what was your first job? Very, very first job. This is, of course, not working for your parents or the worst job. Uh, before I share what my worst job was, uh, Joel. You said to us your first job was being a gymnastics teacher. There you go. Fun fact. Uh huh. Worst job? Worst job? Uh, Dirty CD nightclub photography. Well, no. So the nightclub photography stuff was good fun, but every now and again they were short staffed on floor and I had to jump, or I didn't have to, but I, I, I helped them out and I jumped on floor and that was grim. Like cleaning up a nightclub. Oh, sorry, I think you mean jumped on floor, like doing the worm on the floor of the nightclub. Oh yeah, I jumped on floor, cutting some ships. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I would, uh, I would help the floor staff out every now and again, and just yeah, some of the things I cleaned up, I can never unsee. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, been there, done that as well, totally understand. Mine was kind of similar in the gross factor um, when I had, you know, spoken back to my father. I had to go and pick up uh, rotten maggoty ewes and I had a wee system going on there with a couple of 4 twos off the back of the truck and trying to lever them up and them falling apart. Anyway, moving on. One of the worst jobs at lambing, some people think, on a start, is tagging lambs at birth and matching them up with, uh, sorry, t the ewes, which are scattering everywhere, as we will soon describe as the traditional way of doing it. Uh, of course, we've got DNA um, parentage, but the next phase, joining us now to discuss the new technology known as Smart Shepherd, is animal geneticist Amy Charteris. Amy, for our audience who are not familiar with this whole process that we do here on farms, uh, currently as we tag and measure lambs uh, to, and, measure, and connect them with the ewes. Can you talk us through the current process and moving forward into the future? Of course I can, Sarah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, obviously you've mentioned DNA um, and there's more traditional methods. 
um, of, of recording parentage. Um, the more traditional method is carefully matching up animals, which you'd be surprised, there's a lot of that um, it still happens in the industry and they do do a very good job because generally these people are very meticulous. Um, DNA, on the other hand, I think most people understand how that works. Um, you know, you take a tissue sample from an animal, um, you send that away to the lab, it takes sort of four to five weeks, uh, and you get a result back. Obviously, you know, previously taking a sample from mum and, and dad um, so that you can get that match. Uh, however, the future, uh, which is what I'm here to talk about tonight, um, is Smart Shepherd. Uh, it's, a, it's a new novel technology. Um, which is incredibly exciting uh, and probably, you know, I won't go into it right now, but it's got so many other uh, potential opportunities, not just obtaining parentage. Um, so if everybody hasn't seen one, I've got one here tonight. Um, so here's a wee collar. Um, the way this works is you collar mum and baby uh, and um, it's reasonably quick. So you match the collar with the RFID tag uh, and, and then you leave it on for 48 hours, you take the collar off, uh, both mum and baby, and uh, you send that back to us, and we download the information, and all the work is done by software. Uh, so it's a very uh, quick, smart way, uh, I guess, to um, obtain uh, what would what would take probably with the more traditional methods, sort of up to, well, I've heard of some people anyway, up to three months um, of matching, particularly in the, in the bigger flocks. So the data that you're obtaining through this, what in particular are we measuring and why? Okay, so there's a number of things that we can measure. Um, one, we can obtain maternal pedigree. Um, and so that's really just who mum is. But the cool part about this um, is that, and we're terming it maternal initiative, but basically what the technology does is it measures uh, the number of times mum and baby are interacting, but it also measures the distance at which they're interacting. So it really gives us a sound understanding about the ULAM bond, which is the first time that we've had the ability to do that. I mean, basically, you've got animals in their own natural environment interacting and something silently sort of keeping an eye on them. Um, and, you know, what I really love about it is lamb survival has been a, real, a really large issue. Uh, we haven't moved from the 150%, um, you know, whether we're talking sort of breeding or commercial farms, and that's the exciting opportunity here. Um, increasing uh, lamb survival and therefore weight of lamb output, uh, whether you're talking breeding or commercial, is, is fundamentally an exciting proposition. So basically we're going to cull based on being a poor mother. Um, I feel for Merinos. <laughs> And this coming well, from that, <laughs> or is that just an assumption well, that merinos are bad mothers? That's just an assumption. You know, we've done some work with the merinos, and they're really surprising. Um, and you know, I think there's great potential there. So you know, starting from a low base often means you can go pretty high. So that's that's the really exciting part about it. Okay, so this is fantastic technology um, that yourself and Mike Tate, formerly working on that PGF fund, PGP fund of the Amiga Lamb Project, which of course the headwaters moving into Tamana Lamb, it's very successful. Now you're you're always hungry for the new challenge, Amy. Yourself with Mike have paired up to do this technology, but of course uh, it's, it really needs some grunt in the next phase and funding. Where are you at with that? Oh, she's lost us in terms of sound. Can oh, you hear yeah. us, Amy? What happened there, Joel? <laughs> We've just lost Amy uh, out of Napier. Napier, could you uh, please reconnect the internet at Amy Charteris's place? Can you hear us, Amy? Joel, do you want to give Amy a bit of a call on the phone? Um, so, so for those of you who have just joined us, Smart Shepherd is the technology that's been in beta testing. Uh, Amy Charteris, along with Mike Tate, fantastic uh, two very innovative people in regards to animal genetics and animal measurement. Uh, of course, with the Amiga Lamb project that was part of the PGP funding um, a few years ago and has certainly done wonders in terms of uh, good fats and the omega fats within our lamb. Animal welfare uh, is hugely important to Amy and, of course, uh, having more fat on the ewe and those, those high country conditions ensuring lamb survival. But taking lamb survival another step further with the smart shepherd technology. Can Amy hear us? 
two seconds. I can <laughs> We're just going to give Amy a bit of a call. Let's have a look at down here at the comments. They are starting to rock in, actually. Well done. Eric's back on it. Good on you, Eric. Uh, now, Eric worked in Food Town supermarkets cleaning dishes and emptying ice and filling up the salad bars for the next day. God, I hate doing dishes. Yeah, Eric, you know, that's one thing you need to still do to the day you die is dishes. Alistair and Bernadette Hunt. Um, actually, I hope we got Bernadette Hunt on the show tomorrow. Actually, talking about south and grazing practices, improving uh, with her federated farmer's hat on. First job was working in the local Foursquare supermarket when I was 14. I think I got paid $4.80 an hour. My low, my, my starting rate was $10 an hour, so $4.80 is crazy, but double time on Sundays. Oh, I certainly have done my fair share of rolling ice creams in the terrace store, Bernadette, so I totally know what you mean there. Now we've got Amy back. I mean, we're just, I'm not yeah. sure if you heard me. I was just saying to you, uh, asking about like, it's wonderful what you've done, but how, where's the government funding and taking you into the next step and what does that look like? Yeah, so a lot of the work has been done around the breeding system, but we want to develop this and take it into a commercial system to so make sure the technology is applicable, I guess, to sheep production systems out in the commercial world. Now, what that means is we have to make sure that it can be applied in a really efficient way and form. Um, it needs to be applied at events that are already happening on farms. Uh, and, you know, the return of the information is, is just as quick. Um, but basically, it's all about identifying the best performing ewes so that you can use that information uh, to not only improve land survival, but improve the profitability uh, of the bottom line of, of that sheep operation. Uh, so we're in the process of developing a commercial use selection index uh, and a commercial system, which will take into account body condition score, uh, weight of uh, lamb output, which will get through the smart shepherd collars, uh, and a number of other measures that are simplistic enough to measure in a commercial farming operation, which will then be able to allow us to value each ewe uh, so that we can select the best performing ewes and uh, essentially use them to to produce replacements uh, for the flock um, in the future. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's Amy Charteris with uh, news of Smart Shepherd technology. If you want to read more about that, head to farmersweekly.co.nz. Richard Rennie has written a wonderful article about uh, the new technology and where it's heading into the future. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on your Monday evening. Uh, that's all we've got time for tonight. Of course, if you're new to the show, welcome. Uh, if you want to uh, not have to join live every night, you can actually listen to us on podcast on demand. Search Serious Country wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to try out watching us live on your big screen, check out the YouTube channel on your smart TV and search in Farmers Weekly uh, and you can watch us there. I really, really genuinely appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, and I really love your suggestions of guests. I actually have a lot of emails come through now which is so fantastic. Uh, Sarah at periummedia.com I really uh, enjoy the fact that we are growing together as we grow through our economic recovery together as the best food and fibre sector uh, in the world. So good night, go well and know as I say every time uh, we will weather together. This is Sarah's Country.